seated for a moment. Just want to welcome everyone here, CFC family and friends. Glad to have everyone here today. Uh, those of you watching online, I uh, want to just say a welcome to you. Uh, that last line that we just sang, uh, we'll be dancing in the rain. That may be prophetic at the end of service. It's supposed to be bad weather. We, we just got a news alert, so uh, a weather alert on the phone. So just uh, want to remind everyone, you know, glad to see everyone here. Uh, Again, we are still in phase two of reopening, uh, so we want to make sure that we continue to practice social distancing. Um, so what I like to call it, we're in the MC Hammer phase. You can't touch this, all right? So you just, you know, stay away. So tell them, that <laughs> you're an MC Hammer stage of reopening. So uh, again, through phase two, we will have no nursery. Uh, the nursery is open for a parent to go with their child as a cry room, but uh, as far as bringing all the kids there right now, it's not going to be till phase three. Also, in phase two, will be no van will not be going home to home picking people up. Uh, that's not not safe so social distancing things. Uh, also, Wednesday night services we will not start up again until uh, phase three in the reopening. Uh, also, just one quick reminder. Uh, as we're in phase two, you can only enter through this door here so we can get a good head count. People can get sanitizer, get your stuff. But when service ends, uh, they will open up that back door on that side that if you want to go out through different doors, because uh, sometimes it, it gets cluttered right there as people are leaving. So I uh, just wanted to remind you of that. A uh, few things we also want to remind you of, ways you can watch online and give online, is we have a Facebook page. You can go on there and uh, watch all the sermons from the past. Uh, Facebook is where we do live stream. So those of you watching right now, I want to just welcome you. We know you're on Facebook or you wouldn't be seeing this. Uh, we also have a church app. If you'd uh, look on Facebook, you'll see this little icon there. You click on that and uh, it's a ministry one app. It'll take you to uh, the app store where you download that ministry one app. It'll connect you to our church where you can watch uh, videos from the past, uh, not not live again. We only could uh, do actual live events uh, on Facebook as they're happening, but they have like last week's messages and things. You could give through that app also. We also have a YouTube page for those that don't have uh, Facebook. Uh, you have to go to Christian Fellowship Church, Pastor Scott Jeremy. That'll eliminate the other three million uh, Christian Fellowship Church things on YouTube and kind of get you there. Again, that just has uh, the uh, videos of past sermons. It's not live as I like this second right now. And of course, lastly, is our church website, which is uh, welcome to cfc.com. Uh, there's online sermons there. You could give online uh, through all those things. And for our uh, New Generations Children's Church, ages 6 through 11, they are, they're having service right now. Kids are back there. Uh, again, practicing social distancing, but they are filming, and tonight at 7 p.m., they will be uh, premiering their service of this morning. That way, the kids still, you could get them in front of the computer 7 o'clock tonight, uh, bake them some cookies. If you bake some cookies, y'all call me, uh, but uh, <laughs> y'all can sit down and watch that, too. That way, they're not missing out on their uh, Sunday morning experiences. All right, and that's about all the announcements we have. Do we have anyone having a birthday this week? What, we're pointing where? Right up there. Your birthday? You're having a birthday? What day? What's that? 
the third. Happy birthday to you, all right. I, oh, I, was, I need to remember, Jessica Ross, she's probably watching online. Her birthday was Friday, and I did not mention it last week. I didn't catch it, so I don't want to get in trouble with Jessica. Jessica, we love you. She's watching online. So everybody just scream, happy birthday, Jessica. <laughs> happy birthday, Jessica. All right. Uh, I hope they can control her right now where she's at. <laughs> Anyone else? What? G. Spurs, you having a birthday? When's your birthday? Today? Happy birthday, T. Spurs. All right. All right. What time, what time y'all cutting the cake? What time you cutting the cake? <laughs> All right, that's good. I don't know if he didn't hear me or he don't want to tell me when we cutting the cake. That's what I, was, I don't know with T. Spurs. All right, anyone else having a birthday? All right, what about an anniversary between now and next Sunday? Benny and Janelle, how many years? 29 years, all right. <laughs> Benny said give him 35 years and he'll finally have Janelle train. But <laughs> Amen. Anyone else have an anniversary? All right. Happy birthday and anniversary of anyone watching online. We just want to uh, wish, wish you that too. All right. So if we would, we're going to pick up our tithe and offering uh, this morning. And uh, those of you that may not have been here, uh, what we're going to do is, after I read the scripture, we're going to have this side, the church, get up out there, pew, walk around, put your offering in this basket, and then go down the center aisle to get back to your uh, seats. Then once this side's finished, I'll announce for this side to come up, this side aisle, uh, drop it in the basket and go down the center. So the side aisles are to come up, the center aisle is to go down, okay? We don't want people uh, bumping into each other. Uh, same thing for communion. We will have communion at the end of service, and I'll have you come up and uh, pick up your communion supplies then, okay? So um, let me just uh, find my offering scripture for this week. It says this, and we're going to be using this scripture a little later on this morning. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all in all things, God works for the good. Now, notice that scripture doesn't say all things are good. It says in all things, God works for the good. All right. And so we will go through things in life. He says uh, works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And first Peter five, seven says this, cast all your anxiety, your worries on him because he cares for you. Amen. So if you're uh, not here this morning and you're watching online and you want to uh, help support this ministry, there are several ways you could give. Uh, you could go to welcometocfc.com and give uh, on that website. You can mail it through the regular post office, which is Post Office Box 1427, La Rose, Louisiana. Again, if you don't catch the, uh, if you didn't have something to write it down, you could uh, rewind the video and pause it later uh, to get this information. Or you could actually drop it off Monday. Our Office uh, secretary is only here on Mondays uh, in phase two from nine to two. Uh, you'll see me through me and Pastor Josh throughout the week here, and you could drop it off at any time then that you see it at one of our vehicles here. All right, so just want to uh, get ready to take, pick up the offering. I know I got mine somewhere here. There we go. So take your offering in your right hand and repeat after me this morning. So I, as I give in today's offering, I recognize that God is sovereignly involved in directing my life. I understand that I may make my plans, but it is the Lord who directs my feet. God carefully oversees all that happens to me. No event or no experience escapes his attention. I give today with the confidence in the sovereignty of God. The job I have, the business I run, the money that comes through my hands are under the direction of Almighty God. It is not luck. It is not chance. It is God working on my behalf. Amen, amen. So if you would, we're going to have this side, the church, come up that aisle and uh, you can place your offering in here. This side will just remain seated until they're completely through. So come on up.
How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 Our call to worship for July 2020 is from the message paraphrase, and it's Psalms 138, verses 1 through 5. It says, Thank you. Everything in me says thank you. Angels listen as I sing my thanks. I kneel in worship facing your holy temple and say it again, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Most holy is your name. Most holy is your word. The moment I called out, you stepped in. You made my life large with strength. When they hear what you have, have to say, God, all the earth's kings will say thank you. They'll sing of what you have done. How great the glory of God. Father, we just come to you today. Father, we lift up this entire service to you right now, Father God. We ask that you have your way in this place this morning. Father, I ask that your spirit would move in the homes of those watching online right now, Father. And Father, just invade this place with your presence this morning as we worship you right now, Father God. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together as we worship this morning. Ooh, ooh, I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the wind as it try to shake me. I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. Yeah. 
<laughs> Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. Let's put a, give the Lord a hand clap right now. Again, let's praise the Lord. If you would, you could be seated uh, and get your notes out this morning as we get ready uh, to continue service. We want to dismiss the kids three, four, and five to their class in the back right now. Amen. As they get on the lights. Amen. You might want to put on your sunglasses for a second till you, till your eyes eyes adjust. Amen. 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 How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. I need to make sure we got everything here. Amen. All right. Amen. So if you grab your notes right now, we just want to, I want to hurry up and get started with this. I kind of feel like this is one of those, if I'm not careful, it's, it's one of those Smokey and the Bandit uh, sermons. How, who remembers Smokey and the Bandit? I, I got a long way to go, but I got a short time to get there, so I, I need to be ready. All right. So, oh, we also want to welcome Scott and Marcy Crosby uh, this morning. They're down. Uh, they came check on a house. Uh, pray for them that they have a, a the dad, Scott's dad's house there. They still keep up. They live in Abazo. They're going back. Their freezer broke down here. They lost all their shrimp, all their meat that they had in there. The worst part is it stayed for a month before they knew. So they had to rip floors out the house because it had seeped out. Now, um, so you see, the reason I'm telling you this is so that you're not hungry. You know, I know how we start getting toward lunch and everybody wants to start eating. So I'm going to gross you out a little bit. That way you could stay a little longer. Amen. So, but just uh, continue to pray for them uh, uh, with that. Amen. So if you would get your notes out, uh, this message is entitled, Guard Your Heart. And um, I want you to raise your hand and say, Brother Scott, say, we love you. No matter what you do to us today, no matter what you tell us today, you are just the messenger bringing God's message. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I accept that. We got that on video in case I need to bring it to court. (laughs) Amen. But I want to talk about a message the Lord had put on my heart uh, entitled, Guard Your Heart. Again, we will have communion at the end of service here today. Uh, We got individually wrapped things, uh, so no one's uh, touching and spreading. Again, we're we're still in... uh, coronavirus mode we, we believe in God's going to eradicate this thing and we're going to be all we pray God's protection over each and every one of you here today amen each and every one watching online at home so if you have your Bible you can take it out um, again there's going to be a couple of verses I'm going to put that's not in your notes uh, so uh, I, I added a few things but that'll be in a, uh, later on I want to start with the verse Proverbs 4:23. And notice the very first three words in that. It says what? Above all else. Above all else. Why would he start a statement with above all else? I believe he's letting us know this is top priority. This is one of the things you really have to pay attention to. He says, above all else, guard your heart. Now, I want you to understand that In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew words, where uh, heart is used most of the time, that word heart, it it really identifies, it's not your actual physical beating heart. Uh, It's symbolic of basically your soul. It's dealing with, above all else, guard your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's what your soul is, your mind, what what I think, the way I think. How many times we, we use the scripture that it says that we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ and why would we have to make a thought obedient to Christ because not every thought is obedient to Christ okay so above all else guard your mind but your thoughts your will what is your will it is your desires the things you want done for your life the things you desire in life and how many of you know that Jesus prayed that God's will would be done on heaven in, on earth as it is in heaven. And why did he pray that? Because God's will is not always done on earth. We have our own will, our own desires. If uh, we could go back to the garden, God's will was for Adam and Eve not to eat tree, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Did they eat from it? Yes. So was God's will done on earth? No. 
So we have to guard our heart, our, our will, our desires, and then it deals with our emotions, the way where we're feeling, excitement, different things. So he's saying, above all else, guard your heart, your mind, will, and your emotions. And no, notice what he goes on to say. The reason is, for everything you do flows from it. Uh, another translation says, it is the wellspring of life. Above all else, guard your heart because it is what's going to produce every action you have in your life. So you have to have all this uh, <coughs> uh, uh, guarded and protected. And I'm going to go through several scriptures here and uh, kind of just draw on the picture here be before we go into the, the main part of the text. Proverbs 19.21, which we read a little bit earlier for the offering, it says this, many are the plans in a person's where? Heart. The desires, your will, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So we need to guard our heart because we have many desires in our heart that are contrary to what God wants in our life. And I love the way the big picture is we got free will in, in this life, but God's will will always prevail. God will always, we we'll always have the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we understand that there are many plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's that prevail. Now, no, on the, the very first verse we were talking about says, for uh, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Now, look, look what Jesus says about this. <coughs> Again, he, referring to the end of that, for everything flows from it, for it is the wellspring of life. Notice what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man brings good things, things out of the good stored where? In his heart. A good man brings the good things that are stored in his heart, but an evil man brings evil, the evil that is stored up where? In his heart. So your heart could be filled with good your heart could be filled with evil. And that's where Jesus is talking about. Why, that's, that's why we need to, back in Proverbs where it says, guard your heart for everything you do. It is the wellspring of life. What is in your heart? It is the goodness of God. At the New Testament times, we're born again. Is the Spirit of God living in your heart and, and guiding your life? Or are you just following your own desires and wants? Are you following your plans? Notice another place he says <coughs> in uh, Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, why is he saying your treasure? What is treasure? Value. What is valuable to you in your life, and I'm not talking monetarily here, what is valuable to you, your, your moral standings, your, what do you believe? Uh, that's why we need to guard our hearts and uh, make every uh, thought obedient to Christ. What is valued in your life? Because whatever is valued, is it your desires or is it God's desires? Because that's where your treasure is. Let's look at another verse here. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. See, sometimes we think we're smarter than God. Sometimes we think we got things figured out. And you know, that, that, that where uh, it says, uh, with the enemy meant for evil... God turns it into a victory. How many of you know that when we see it as the evil act first, we don't see the victory in it? We just see it as the, the, the worst act coming upon us. But God sees the future. God knows the future. God knows the outcome. Outcome. God could see the big picture. We, we're so limited in what we see. That's why the Bible tells us don't live by sight, but by faith. Because if you strictly go on by what you see, when the enemy comes against you, you will just be overwhelmed by what the enemy's doing and not see the victory of the Lord in the future. He says, so trust in the Lord with all your heart. Again, with all your mind, with all your will, with all your emotions. Trust in him. Lean not on your own understandings. And then verse 6, notice what it says. In all your ways, 
submit to him. What what does that word submit? It means to let him be in control. In other words, he's telling you, lean not on your own understanding, but trust God and submit to God's word and God's will in your life. And he says that when you, if you submit to him, he will make your path straight. And verse 7 says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. And we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but remember all these scriptures. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Don't be wise. Don't think you got it all together. You got things figured out. In these areas. And then the last thing dealing with the heart is Psalms 119.11. David says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word where? In my heart. And what, what does that do? It protects us and helps us from sinning because we submit to God. Uh, we, we surrender our thoughts, our wills, and emotions to him, and we begin to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So here's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Is as Christians, am I struggling with sin in my life or am I living in sin? There's a big difference. Am I struggling with sin, which every single, I want every single person to raise your hand up right now. We are all on that first part. We all struggle with sin. And, and again, you can put your hands down now. Uh, I want you to understand when I'm talking about sin, I, I believe, this is Scott Sheremy's theory. I believe God is such a holy God that we, don't even, we can't even comprehend his holiness. And that's why I believe the Bible tells us the most righteousness of a man is as a filthy rag in the eyes of the Lord. That, you know, when we begin to think that we've got it made, that God, woo, we are impressing God with our great ability. I believe that we sin when we don't even know we're sinning. Because when you compare it to God's holiness. Now, when, when we compare ourselves to other people, we may be able to pat ourselves on the back. But when you stand before, you stand before God, he's not going to say, well, let's compare you to so-and-so. You can't compare imperfection with imperfection. You compare yourself to Jesus Christ who lived on earth, and he, he, he broke every, every, every sin curse on us, and he showed us how to overcome this world. And how did he do it when he was tempted in the garden? It is written. He went back to the word of his father, which said these things. So am I uh, struggling with sin, which we all do, or am I willfully living in habitual sin? There's a big difference. Let, Let me ask this question. How many of you believe in God's word? How many of you believe that God's word is the truth and the only truth? Okay? So today, don't kill the messenger. (laughs) You see, let me stop here for a second. There's a difference between believing in God and believing God. Think about when Jesus was walking on the earth. There's many that believed he existed. Pharisees and Sadducees all believed. People all heard and seen him do miracles. They knew about him, but not all of them believed him. Many believed in him. Oh, I've seen him. I've seen all this. I know he exists, but few believed him. See, few became his disciples students, followers of him. Many rejected him, although they believed in him. There's a big difference. So knowing we just confessed to that God's word is true, let's look at a couple of things here. And, and this isn't in your notes, but I want to put up Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 
<coughs> Again, this is the message paraphrase. Because I love the way it says it here. It makes it very easy to understand. Every part of Scripture, every part from Genesis to Revelation, it, it, this isn't in your notes right now. This is uh, something I added. He says, every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another to do what? Show us truth. God's Word shows us truth. In other words, if you read something in God's Word and you don't agree with it, He's trying to show you what is true, that you're believing a lie. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, and a life, meaning that there would be others. He says, I'm the only one. This is the only way. So it says, he show, God's word shows us truth, exposing what? Our rebellion. In other words, his truth shows us where we don't agree with him and we rebel with his word. It corrects our, correcting our mistakes where we think wrong and training us to do what? Live God's way. All right, so is there another verse there? I didn't have the, yeah. Through what? The word. Through the word we are put together and shaped for the task that God has for us. So through his word we are put together and shaped for the task he has for us. So when we realize that, that God's word teaches us, corrects us, can I tell you something? God's not wrong. We are. God's word is not an error. We are. And when we don't agree with God's word, what happens is it's our rebellion. God told Adam and Eve, don't eat or you will surely die. Do you think they thought they would die? They had all the reasoning. They started reasoning. They became wise in their own eyes. Boy, look at that. It's pleasing for food. It's good for food. Lust of the flesh. Pleasing to the eyes. You think when she took the fruit, she said, oh, here, I'm, here comes death? No. What did they reason? Here comes, I'm going to be more like God. This is the way to be more like God. God made a mistake. He, he, he didn't understand. We've come up with our own way. Don't be wise in your own understanding, in your own ways. Now, <clears throat> thinking about that, I want to just put up Romans 1.28 which is in your notes at toward the end. We'll get to it again, but I want to tie these two together. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. In other words, there are people who do not think it's worthwhile believing God. Oh, I know God's word says this, but can I tell you, don't be offended by this, but keep your butt out of it. I know God's word says it, but let me interject my wisdom and my knowledge. Just as they did not think it worthwhile. Why? Because it would change their life. It wasn't, it wasn't conforming to what they wanted to do in life at their will, their purpose, their desire. Their heart wasn't guarded to keep God's word in it. They, can I put it this way? They want God to be with the God that they want, not who he is. That, that's the problem with people. We want a God that we're going to... We, we want a Burger King God. God, I want you my way. I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Hold this. I don't want this in it. And we try to build God into what we want him to be. But can I tell you, friends, you can't have it that way. 
God is who he is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it says, they did not think it worthwhile to retain his knowledge. So God gave them over to their depraved mind. God said, well, if that's the way you want, then you go. And then it goes on to say, so that they would do, so they would do what ought not be done. And this is where we're at today, and this is where I'm going to ask you. Are you struggling with sin, or are you willfully, habitually living in sin? That's what we want to talk about this morning. Let's look at a few things here in Scripture. We're back on your notes, and everything I'm going to talk about is going to be in your notes. 1 John 3.6 says this. No one, how many people is that? No one. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Now, we're going to break this down again, okay? No, we, we all sin. I, I've already made that statement. We all sin without even knowing, okay? And the, the Word of God said, says that God looks at our hearts, Okay, God knows the intention of your heart. That's the key. It's not really our actions, it's our heart. How is your heart? And that's what we, we're talking about here this morning. So he says, no one who continues uh, in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin either has seen him or known him. And I want you to understand, this is where he's starting to make a distinction between two types of people. Of what, as, we, as we, just as believers, we, we still sin, but not, you, we're, we struggle with sin. Sometimes we sin when we don't even know because you, your, your thoughts can be sin. This is what, where we need to catch this. Where Jesus made, was asked the question, what about adultery? And Jesus says, if you lust after somebody in your heart, your thought life, your mind, will, and emotions, you're just as guilty of committing adultery with that person if you've actually done the physical activity. So you see, it's not just... <laughs> so many people say Jesus came to do away with the law, but can I tell you something? He's increased everything. In the Old Testament, it was just don't have the physical sex. And you could have adultery. But he says in the New Testament, now if you lust even in your heart, you're just guilty. So no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. If you, if you want to live in habitual sin that you just don't care anymore, you have to wonder, am I truly saved? Is the Spirit of God truly living in you? Is it, are you walking in the Spirit? Are you walking? Have you submitted to Him? Or you said, never mind. Let, let's get going. I, I need to read a few more. Somebody started the Smokey and the Bandit theme song. I'm just realizing we've got a long way to go. So, <laughs> Notice Galatians 5, 19 and 26. This is a before and after picture. Anybody ever seen those before and afters? You see, me, when I was young... This is before, this is after. <laughs> right? There's before and afters of everything. And uh, when he gives, uh, Paul's given a description here of before a person saved. This is how we all used to live and all these things. But then he begins to show this is how your life should be after. There, again, I always make this thing. Is there a difference between a live person and a dead person physically? Can you tell the difference? Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Can you tell the difference when we have the lights on and we have it completely dark? It's very obvious. How many of you would say we got the lights on right now? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you think we have the lights off? Nobody. It's very easy to tell the difference. Nobody's wondering. And God said, Paul's telling us through, uh, God, God's telling us through Paul that there is a distinct difference between being a Christian and a person of the world. 
Now notice what he goes on to say. This is before. The acts of the flesh are obvious. He's saying it's not hard to tell the difference. It's not, ooh, I wonder. It's like night and day. He says they are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, self-ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, I warn you as I did before. I warn you as I did before. In case you didn't hear before, I need to tell you again, I warn you that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Then in the very next verse, he says, that was your before life. This is how life should look now. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, which is part of the heart of your soul. He says, which is desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? So then he goes on to tell us this in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, we need to examine ourselves to see whether you are in the faith. And he says, test yourself. He's, he doesn't say, hey, just take it for granted. You know, because in the Bible, Jesus says that on that day, many will come to say, uh, uh, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I never knew you. So we need to examine ourselves and test. He says that we need to pass the test, and we're, we're going to give a, a, a test here in a second. So it says this, uh, <coughs> let me find where I, test yourselves. And he says, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless... Of course, you fail to test. How many of you ready to take the test? <laughs> Amen. Uh, I hated tests in school. It always proved how much you didn't study. <laughs> so let's begin with a few things. And again, these things are all interacting and things... Let me get on quickly. The first thing we need to ask ourselves, or letter A, is am I experiencing conviction followed by remorse in my life? Again, he's telling me, examine yourself and test yourself. Am I experiencing conviction followed by remorse in my life? Remorse is feeling guilty of. Conviction is not condemnation. Conviction is that, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have done what I did. You know, or maybe this isn't right. Maybe I should. I know everybody else is doing this, but as a Christian, I shouldn't. I shouldn't participate in that. Another way to ask is, does what breaks God's heart breaks mine? Is what, what breaks God's heart, does it break yours? Look what he says here in Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh, our soul, mind, will, and emotions desires what is contrary to the spirit. We want what we want, when we want it, how we want it. Perfect example. When you pray, what do we pray for most of the time? We tell God what we want how we want it, when we want it, right? That's why, and, and we are to pray in that way, but that's why I always say, I always love to end, but thy will be done. Because God's will is more important than our will. God's desires. He says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are 
not to do whatever you want. So are you feeling that? Do it, when some things come up, again, as, just as a struggling, as, as a Christian, maybe it'd be something you're, you're, you're battling and going through, and you're struggling, and you, remorse is that you feel guilty about it. Or do you could live life and say nothing bothers you? It's God's Spirit in you, conflicting with, with your will and desires want. Number two, or letter B. Am I justifying my sin? In other words, am I making excuses for my sin? Am I justifying my sin? Making excuses for Proverbs 28, 13, and 14 says this. Whoever conceals or hides or doesn't admit something is a sin... Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses was the opposite of concealing, confessing. The one that confesses and renounces, in other words, forsakes, turns from, uh, uh, they find mercy. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. You see, if I don't have conviction in my life, with the, back to part one, my heart has been hardened. And I don't feel God's spirit tugging at my heart because I've become so callous to him. Now, am I justifying my sin? I may step on some toes here but I have to share it. So if you might want to put your feet under the pew. <laughs> Am I justifying sin? Am I making excuses for my sin? Have you ever heard, well, I was born that way? That's the way God made me? Can that be a valid excuse for anything of sin? Let me see. Let, let's go to do this. I was born in a fallen state. I was born a sinner. Is that okay to stay that way? What does God tell me? That I should be, I was born once in a fallen, broken, messed up state. I need to be born again. Because he doesn't want me to remain in that original state. To put it this way, God forms us, sin deforms us, but Christ transforms us. Okay? Okay? So I can never use the excuse, that's how God made me. Or this is what I could say, I am a serial killer. They, they have serial killers in this world. And they, for some reason, they have a desire to kill. Even as children, they say a lot of serial killers as children, they would kill animals and doing these things. And would it be okay for that serial killer to come out and say, well, that's just the way God made me. None of us would be fine with that. Right? I was born lost, so that's just the way God made me, and that's how I should stay. No. You see, it, it's easy when we start talking about things like that. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, what about a, a, someone who molests children? An adult that, that's into sex trafficking with children. Can they just come to tell you, well, that's a desire in me. That's the way God made me. So it's okay? No. Here's where we're going to. A homosexual who practices and lives the life of homosexuality. What are they saying? That's the way God made me. So you see, they need to try and justify why they're living that life of sin. But reality, God didn't make you that way. Sin deformed you. That's why you may have been born feeling that way, but that's why we need to be born again. 
because you were born in a broken nature, a broken state. Just as I was born in a fallen, broken, lost state, I needed to be born again. Just as a serial killer is uh, may be born with that desire in his heart for some reason, but he needs to be born again. It's not okay for him to keep doing that. And for me to look in God's word and try and excuse that and say it's okay for me, I am rebelling against the word of God. I'm trying to make an excuse. Let us see. Let, let's move on. I could talk about a few more things there, but. And let me back up there for a second. If you're struggling with homosexuality, watching online, God does not love you any less than he loves me. God does not love you any less than that. Jesus didn't go to the cross and die for everybody except homosexuals. Okay? He died for every sinner. We're all sinners. We need to repent from our sin and turn from our sin. We need to be born again. So let her see. Am I making plans to sin? Am I making plans to sin? Again, in the beginning, am I uh, experiencing conviction and remorse? Meaning guilt of it. As next is, am I making excuses for my sin? Uh, letter C, am I making plans to sin again? And, and I'll explain this in a second more. There are, Proverbs six sixteen through 19 says, There are six things the Lord hates. Seven are detestable to him. Verse 17 says, Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and verse 18 is where we need to focus on, a heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet are quick to rush into evil. Verse 19 says, a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Verse 18 is what we want to focus on, a heart that devises wicked schemes. What is a wicked scheme? Anything that goes against the word of God. Can we put it this way? In today's society, we have many people that decide to live together instead of get married. Or they say, you know, we're going to live together for a while. We're going to kick the tires of this thing. Is, is that planning to go against God's word? Uh, when I was youth pastor, that's what I used to tell the kids all all the time. You know, when dealing with things with sex and things, and and they, oh, how are we going to get married? Oh yeah, every everybody in tenth grade is marrying that person they're dating because they're so in love, and they make an excuse for that sex. Oh, but we're getting married. Well, until you get married, it is wrong in the eyes of the Lord. You can make every excuse you want, but it is wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Let's move on to the next one. Letter D. Am I abusing God's grace? Am I abusing God's grace? And these are things that, that we find that am I just struggling with a sin or am I choosing to habitually live a life of sin? Am I abusing God's grace? I love that song we sing, Holy Water. And that's one of the lines that I don't want to ever abuse your grace. And I believe there's two ways we abuse God's grace. I talked about one of them uh, uh, a few sermons ago. Is that when a person thinks they're so holy in themselves that they no longer need God's grace. That, you know, they start patting themselves on the back so much and I'm the best thing God said since you made sliced bread. I'm the best thing out there. That they become so holy and all they do is look at the, the speck in their brother's eye while they got the plank in their own eye because they're too blind to see all the faults in their life. And I have just as many faults as everyone else. E everyone does. We're human beings. And when I begin to think I am so good and I got it so much together that I don't need God's grace almost. I get so arrogant. That's an abuse of God's grace. But the other side of that coin is where someone thinks I could be, well 
I could just do whatever I want to do. God's grace got me covered. We are saved by faith, not by works, which is true. But what is your heart condition? Because God looks at the heart. Notice what Romans 6, 1 and 2 says. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? And, and the verses before talks about God's grace increasing. And think, so we go on sinning that gr- grace may increase. Look at the first three words in verse 2. By no means. Those of you online in other states who want to understand this, but it's a ben no. No way. That means, of course not. Eh ben non. Now, if you're not careful, you say it too fast, it sounds like you're saying a banana. Eh ben non? Eh ben non? <laughs> so he says, by no means shall we go on sinning that grace may increase. So I don't want to abuse God's grace that says, well, it doesn't matter how I live. Because I'm covered by his mercy and grace. You see, that's where you go back to the first one, well, apparently you're not having any more conviction or remorse in your life. Lastly, letter E, am I encouraging others to join me in my sin? Am I encouraging others to join me in my sin? And this one I'm going to tie back to am I justifying my sin again? Because I could hear some arguments. Oh, you use the murderer or pedophile, all these things. And the problem with those things is that person is hurting someone else. Right? That, that's a good argument. Homosexuality is two consenting adults. And it's not harming anyone. Really? If, I, my, if I, my life causes you to sin, am I not harming you? If having you be in a relationship with me brings sin into your life, is that not harming that person? So is is my life affecting others? Notice what it says, and this is where we read earlier, Romans uh, 1, 28, and we're going to go through verse 32. Again, Paul Paul is addressing a homosexual culture in, in this time, and he says this, Furthermore, Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what they ought not be done. They have become filled with, notice this, every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters. Well, I hate to tell you, but that, I see a lot of that on the news today, what's going on in, in this country. They become insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Just when you think they can't do anything else, they come up with a new way that it's like blows your mind. It, 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 y'all watch the news and say it can't get more ridiculous than this. Well, guess what? Surprise in the morning, they just reached a new level of ridiculousness. I hope I don't go to Facebook jail for this. <laughs> verse 31, uh, verse 30, they're slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree. Now, here's the key. They know what God says. They make an excuse to justify, just as we were talking here, you make an excuse to justify your sin. Although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve debt, debt, he says they not only continue, now notice this isn't struggling, not a struggle with sin, this is a willing, habitual person that says I'm going to sin, I don't care because I don't believe, I know God's word says, but Let me fill him with my wisdom and knowledge of why it's not wrong. 
Although they know the righteous decrees of God that those who do such things deserve that, they not only continue to do this, the very things, but they approve those who practice with them. So if my life causes someone else to sin, it's bringing harm to their life also. So we'll close with this scripture. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let who? Us. Let us throw off. In other words, he said, that's where he's talking about guarding your heart. You have to make the decision. You have to choose what you do with your life. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And, and I always stress this point. At, at this part, he says, there are things that hinders. And he says, and the sin that so easily entangles. But there are things that are not, you'd say, well, it's not really sin, but it still can hinder your walk with God. And he says, let us run the race, uh, run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That statement doesn't make sense if you're not knowing what it was really saying. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's not saying that the cross was enjoyable for him. The cross was a horrible experience for him. But he knew if he went to the cross, the victory it would bring you and me. And then he asked us to daily crucify ourselves, to follow him. Here's my question for you. Are you living your life to be transformed into the image of God's son? Or are you trying to transform God into the image you want him to be? That's the difference between a person that is struggling with sin and a person that is habitually living in sin. That says, I know what God's word says, but I'm going to justify it and insert all my reasoning of why I stay in sin. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured so much opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, sad sad to say a lot of times is people are scared of change. Because I've been living this way for so long, I don't know. If I could trust God. But it says, lean not on your own understanding. Trust in him. And then he will make your path straight. Amen. So that's the test Paul asks of us. And I just pray that we all admit we fall short of the glory of God. And we need a savior. If you could have done it by yourself... Christ would not have had to die on the cross. Amen? So as we get ready just to receive the emblems this morning uh, for communion, I want everyone just to bow their head for a second. And we just want to ask God to forgive us of any sin that we may have in our life right now. So, uh, Father, we just come to you right now. And, Father, I just pray that each and every one of our hearts would be stirred this morning, Father. And that you bring to awareness, Father God, things that may be in our life that are not pleasing to you, Father God. Sin that we may not even be aware of that's in our life right now, Father. We ask your forgiveness, Father God, as we repent and turn from those things. And as we get ready to receive communion this morning, if you're not a member of Christian Fellowship Church, you're still welcome to receive communion here. You don't have to be a member of Christian Fellowship Church. You just have to be a Christian, that you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've never done that before, I want to give you that opportunity, those watching at home also. 
I just want you to invite Christ into your heart right now. Let God transform you through the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, his son. We are born broken in this messed up world, but Christ says we must be born again. So just say this simple prayer with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I admit that I fall short in many areas of my life. But I believe that you love me so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And I believe he raised from the dead and is seated at your right hand side. I accept the forgiveness right now and invite Christ to come into my heart to be Lord of my life and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Now, as we get ready for communion, what we're going to do is each, on, on these tables, they're separated, so we want you to not touch any of the other containers there uh, for COVID thing. Um, each container has a wafer and the grape juice in it, okay? There's two lids that you're going to peel off. The first one, you'll get the wafer. The second one, you'll get the grape juice. Uh, what I'm asking is if, if you have more than one person in your family to help cut down on the amount of people coming up together. Uh, if, if there's two of you, just have one person come up and get two. If you're a family of five, have one person come up and get the five for everybody and bring it back. What we're going to do is start with the two side aisles, You'll come up and get your uh, emblems on each side and then make your way back to your seat. Then we're going to ask the two center sections to come get theirs and hold on to the emblems to the end so we all uh, receive it together. So at this time, Brother Darren, if you want to start uh, uh, music, this aisle and the very side aisle over there, come up and get your communion emblems and hold them till we receive it all together. You bore our freedom on the cross. If there's anyone who saved you, you for my sin, you died and rose again. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. Lord, you gave, you gave. I just want to read. From Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. It says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst you. For I tell you, I will not drink again until the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of uh, God comes. 
And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them and sa saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which was poured out for you. Father, as we come to here today, we give thanks for your amazing grace and mercy that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us through your son, Jesus Christ, that he willingly died and suffered on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, as we receive the emblems today, we remember that price he paid, Father, for the joy set before him that we too could enter into a relationship with you through his precious blood that was shed for us. We thank you for that right now and receive the emblems. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, you could carefully peel back the first layer and take the bread and then try not to spill when you're peeling off the second one for the juice. Let's pray as we close. Father, I thank you for this beautiful morning that you've given us, Father God. The opportunity to come and share your word this morning, the opportunity that of those that are here to come and hear your word this morning. Father, we never want to take for granted the freedoms we have in this country to come and worship you, Father. Father, I just pray a hedge of protection over this country right now. Father, I pray against this coronavirus that's going around. I pray that everyone would be healed and protected, Father God, from catching this. And Father, I pray that every weapon and snare and trap the enemy has tried to devise on this country right now be broken. Father God, I just pray right now that your spirit of peace would flow across this country and bring healing, Father God, to every color and person and sex in this nation, Father God. We just thank you for that. Because the victory is yours, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday morning. Amen.